Hello and welcome to the third lecture in a series of lectures on linear regression. Hopefully if you progressed from lecture one to lecture two and now into this lecture, uh, you've got a reasonably good level of confidence in understanding and using linear regression. Uh, the way we'll begin this lecture is we'll review some basic concepts from lectures one and two. Also, uh, given the large number of slides that I have in material to present, uh, this lecture will be presented in two parts in order to keep the recording sizes reasonable and to give you a break between uh, the first part and the second part. Key points from lecture one. In lecture one, we covered concepts. That was the most important part and the focus for lecture one. We learned that regression is a study of relationships among variables. Uh, we also uh, spent some time understanding that the object of our study, the primary focus, is our dependent variable. And what we try to do is to bring in different independent variables to see what impact or influence they have on the dependent variable. We also learned in lecture one that in order to make sure that we can use linear regression, we need to use the scatter plot diagram in order to make sure that there's a linear relationship between our dependent variable and each independent variable. If we're doing simple linear regression, of course, we only have one independent variable, so we need to make sure that there's a linear relationship. We also studied in lecture one the algebra of lines. And this was extremely important because the Understanding this algebra, the fact that y is equal to mx plus b, which is the slope and the intercept, enables us to understand um, the, the content that we get when we conduct a regression analysis. We also mentioned in lecture one that because we're dealing with uh, sample data, usually, rather than complete data, that we modify our formula slightly to indicate that we're using a sample which may have some level of error. And therefore, our original equation, y equal mx plus b, is adjusted. And we use the equation y hat equals b0, which is the y-intercept, plus b1x, which is the slope. And that's the format of, of our equation when we're conducting regression analysis. Finally, in a very important concept, we learned in, from lecture one <clears throat> that the distance that each of our observations lie from our, our, our straight line is called re the residual. It's also called the error. And, and we learned a number of things. Uh, we learned that the further away the observations are from our regression line, uh, the higher the, the amount of error that we're likely to encounter. And we also uh, recognize that what we'd like to do as we conduct regression analysis is to make sure we understand how much error that, we're, that we have in our regression model and, and understand ways to reduce that level of error. So those are key concepts from lecture one. As we progress to lecture two, which was titled Simple Linear Regression, uh, we learned that we can use regression analysis, uh, and we use simple linear regression analysis when we have a dependent variable and only one independent variable. And we learned in that uh, lecture uh, that it's necessary, as, as is the case with all linear regression, to do a bit of pre-work um, to actually take the uh, dependent variable and independent variable observations, enter them into a spreadsheet, and then uh, generate a scatter plot diagram uh, to make sure that the uh, relationship between the dependent variable and independent variable is to some extent linear. We also check this um, in lecture two by looking at the correlation coefficient. If we have a correlation coefficient that's a strong correlation, uh, for example, uh, 0.8 or 0.9 or 0.7, uh, we recognize that we have a, a highly correlated set of variables to work with. And if we have a very low correlation coefficient, like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3, uh, we start to believe that 
there's not a lot of sense in using uh, linear regression because the relationship really isn't uh, linear and, and doesn't have good predictive value. We learned in lecture two how to run a regression using statistical software. Uh, and we learned in lecture two how to interpret the results. Uh, we, uh, when we interpret the results, uh, we're looking at two different dimensions. One dimension is uh, what is the quality of this model? Is it a good model? And secondly, uh, what can we uh, do with this model? How do we interpret the data we got back and how do we use it in, in the context of what we're trying to do? Now I'm going to very quickly uh, go back through an example that we used in lecture two of simple linear regression because we're simply going to build on that example, uh, the concepts in the example from lecture two as we move into multiple linear regression. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, once again run linear regression, interpret the output. Uh, we're going to use the example that we talked about for simple linear regression. And if you listen to lecture two, you'll recall uh, that we had a, a problem. And the problem was to be able to, uh, to predict how much tips a, a restaurant and the restaurant staff will earn based on knowing how much the patrons paid for their meals, which is the bill amount or the meal amount. And so in order to, uh, to model this uh, relationship between the dependent variable, tips, which is what I want to know about, and be able to see to what extent the meal amount or the bill amount influences the tip amount, uh, I had to open a spreadsheet, enter the observations, and you can see on the right-hand side of this slide that's been done. In column A, the independent variable bill amount has been listed, and each meal amount is listed under bill amount. And in column B, <coughs> excuse me, I entered the dependent variable tip amount and each observation that, that goes with each bill. And so you can see the bill amount in column A and the tip amount in column B. Notice that I also created, when I entered this into the spreadsheet, labels at the top. And I like to uh, indicate so that I don't get confused or, or forget which uh, uh, column is my, represents my independent variable and which column represents my dependent variable. I also calculated the average at the bottom because the average is, uh, has some, some usefulness uh, as we learned in lecture two. Um, so uh, I did this. I also, uh, in my statistical package, defined this data range um, as being columns A2 through B8. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second. So in order to uh, run a regression analysis, as I said in lecture two, uh, you would not try to do that just using native Excel. It's too difficult. Uh, so you would acquire uh, or borrow or use a statistical analysis software package. Uh, SPSS is very popular among students. Uh, since some students uh, acquire a textbook that has Palisades stat tools that comes with it for free, that's the, that's the software package that will be used in the examples that we see here in lecture three. So uh, as uh, mentioned before, uh, what I did here was uh, I entered my data into the spreadsheet, and you can see that in the upper left-hand corner. Um, because Stat Tools is an add-in, I started Stat Tools, and once it uploaded, it became a tab now in my Excel spreadsheet. And you can see that tab located here in the top right, Stat Tools. Now, once I click on that tab, I see all the different options. So the first thing I did on the left-hand side was I went into Dataset Manager, and I uh, highlighted my data in cells A3 uh, through, through this B cell, this bottom cell here in the tip amount, and I set that to be my data set. Then I went over here to where the circle is at the top, and I selected regression uh, correlation, and this box came up that you see on the right-hand side, this dialog box. In the dialog box, I set my independent variable to be bill amount, which is consistent with what I entered in my spreadsheet, and my dependent variable to be tip amount, which is the focus of my study. Can I predict my tip amounts? And once I did that, I clicked the OK at the bottom of the screen, uh, 
and um, stat tools gave me regression output. And this was the regression output that I received back from stat tools. Now we spent a lot of time in lecture two, or at least some time, uh, trying to understand these pieces of data. Because if you knew nothing about linear regression and you were to get this printout, you wouldn't know what to do with it. And so we spent a lot of time building on the concepts from lecture one. We spent time in lecture two trying to understand what we're seeing here. And so I diagrammed each of the elements of this output for you in lecture two. And I'll show that to you one more time. So uh, as you look at the output that we just saw, uh, I've highlighted certain things here. Uh, the important uh, elements uh, starting at the top the R square and the adjusted R square tell us to what extent the meal amount is likely to predict or influence the tip amount. And using the adjusted R square, which is always slightly small, smaller than the R square, uh, we can tell that the meal amount predicts six to 68 percent uh, the amount of the tip variance. Now that that means that for 32 percent, something else is causing tips to vary, but we know that the meal amount has some degree of correlation to the tip amount, and, and that's a 68% relationship. Uh, if we move down to the p-value on the right-hand side, uh, we ask ourselves, you know, what's the level of significance in the relationship between bill amount and tip amount? Is it significant? And we hold ourselves generally to a 0 0.05 or less test as you can see here, 0 0.02 is the uh, p-value, and therefore this is a significant relationship, and we can feel comfortable proceeding with our analysis of these two variables. Uh, as we uh, come to uh, the lower portion of the diagram, you can see in the middle that our sum of square of error, our SSE, uh, for our unexplained uh, variable is 30.07. Now, is that important or not? Well, I can tell you that that's a reasonably small uh, amount of, of error. Uh, the error is the distance that each of the observations lie from the, um, from the regression line. And if you'll recall, when we used just the dependent variable values for this example, we got a sum of squares of 120. And so by adding meal amount, we've reduced the amount of error in the equation from 120 down to 30, so we know we've got a significantly good model here. And then finally, if you come to the very bottom in the regression table and look at the coefficients, you can understand how to use this. And so uh, what this is saying to us as we take the slope and put it in the slope place in the equation and the y-intercept and put it in the y-intercept place is it says for every $1 that the independent variable increases, the dependent variable will follow it by 14.6 cents, by 15 cents. And so what this is basically saying is for every dollar uh, that the tip, that the meal amount is likely to go up, the tip is likely to go up by 15 cents as well. Now if there was a negative number in front of the 0.1462, that would suggest that every time the meal amount goes up by a dollar, the tip amount decreases. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And we've got a positive number here. So we know that they move in the same direction, that if the meal amount, the independent variable goes up, our dependent variable, our follower, will go up by 15 cents. And so we learned uh, how to interpret that. And this is a quick review of what we learned in lecture two. And what did we conclude from this? We concluded, as I mentioned, that the uh, coefficient of determination, the R square, uh, of 0.75 or 0.68 if you're using the adjusted R-square uh, means that we can explain 75% or 68% depending on what you use uh, of the uh, change uh, in the relationship in independent variable in terms of the tip amount. Uh, we also noticed that the range of error along the regression line is 2.74. Uh, you'll have to go back to lecture two to get into that in more detail. We did get a significant relationship between these variables of 0 0.02, which is less than 0 0.05. Uh, and we studied our equation, which was able to predict that for every $1 increase in the bill amount, uh, we were likely to get a 15 cent increase in tip amount.
We had a low standard of error, which says this is a reasonable model. We had an SSE, which was uh, substantially below uh, the worst case SSE with only a dependent variable. And so based on all of the above, we concluded that the regression model uh, produced a good fit, reasonable fit, and explained 75% of the interaction between the independent variable and the dependent variable. And it gave us an equation that would enable us to be able to, to estimate um, what happens when the bill amount is likely to change. And, and the way that works is, and I'll just go back very quickly, if we substitute the bill amount x, then we can multiply the 15 cents times x, uh, taking away the y-intercept, in order to be able to, to figure out uh, the likely tip amount that we're likely to get. So that's what we covered in lecture uh, one. We also talked about different perspectives of using that information. Um, but now it's time to move on to multiple linear regression and to ask ourselves uh, if we wanted to explain more of the change, uh, more of the, the R square, uh, we could add multiple variables to an equation. And that's what this part is about. So uh, we're going to change to a different example uh, just to uh, give us a different perspective of how to use regression. Uh, in the example that we're going to discuss, uh, we're going to imagine that an owner of a package delivery business wants to analyze the delivery truck performance. Uh, and, and the key thing that the business owner wants to understand is about the time that it takes uh, to do a, a trip with a delivery truck. So time is the primary thing that he wants to analyze, and therefore it's going to be our dependent variable. Now, uh, there are multiple factors that determine how long a trip takes. One of the factors is the distance that the driver has to travel. And the owner kind of thinks that another variable would include how many stops that the driver has to make uh, as, he, as he goes on each trip. And so those are going to be our two independent variables. We're going to look at time traveled as our dependent variable, miles traveled as one independent variable, and number of stops as another, or deliveries as another independent variable. So um, that's the equation. You can see in the bottom right hand uh, diagram that I, again, set this up in Microsoft Excel. I listed the first independent variable in column A is miles traveled. And you can see I've got uh, multiple observations. Uh, you can see in column B, I set up the second independent variable as the number of deliveries. Uh, and you can see the observations in column B. And then in column C, I listed the dependent variable, and that's how much time each trip took. So we have uh, a nine observations. Uh, first trip traveled 89 miles, made four stops, took seven hours. Second trip, 66 miles, only one stop, took 5.4 hours, and so on. I also, as I always do, is I calculate the average. The, for these nine observations, the average distance was 80 miles. There shouldn't be a dollar sign on that. Um, the uh, number of deliveries should be three. The average number of deliveries, no dollar sign. And the time that it took should, is an average of six hours. Again, there shouldn't be dollar signs there, but I'm sure you all will forgive me for that minor formatting here. So uh, we want to run this, this regression analysis. Now, in order to uh, understand um, how to do this, we have to understand uh, an important concept. And uh, the concept is, uh, has two different elements to it. One is that uh, in regression analysis, when we get into multiple regression, it's possible to add too many variables. And as you start to add more and more and more variables, it's possible that you can actually diminish um, the effectiveness of your uh, model, the quality of your model. And then the second, the second issue is, uh, as you add multiple independent variables, it's possible that those independent variables that you're adding also are influencing each other in addition to the dependent variable. <coughs> when this occurs, when the independent variables have this uh, impact on each other, it can create a distortion in our analysis. And we have a name for this. We call it multicollinearity. And so one of the, the things that you have to be able to do uh, when you're using multiple regression analysis 
is to understand when two or more independent variables uh, are colliding with each other and creating some noise in the model that you really don't want to have in your model. So we need to talk about this concept of multicollinearity. I think overfitting uh, will be less of a problem, but if you start adding too many variables and you just keep adding variables, uh, you, you do run the risk of, of putting too much complexity into your model and actually diminishing the effectiveness of the model. But the bigger issue, even if you have uh, two independent variables or three or four, is uh, being able to examine the relationship between the independent variables to see if they're going to collide with each other, to see if the multicollinearity exists. And so, uh, as it says here, the ideal situation is for all the independent variables to have a good, strong relationship with a dependent variable, but not with each other. And so, in order to uh, get ready to do a multiple regression, you have to do a little bit of thought analysis and maybe a few steps to say, is, is there a likelihood for multicollinearity in this regression model? Uh, two diagrams. This diagram uh, is the one based on the example we're using where we're trying to examine the impact of the number of miles traveled on time and the number of deliveries on time. And you can see the blue arrow and the green arrow um, moving from the two independent variables towards time is the relationships that we're most interested in. But you see the red line between the two independent variables uh, is the question, are these two variables highly correlated? Are they, did, did they influence each other? And if in fact that's the case, uh, the probability that multicollinearity exists and, and it can create uh, error in our model could force false predictions. And so we'll talk in a minute about, so what do we do if we see that there's a multicollinear relationship? How do, we, how do we minimize the damage? What do we do to fix it? Now, you can see when you introduce four independent variables that not only do, does each of the four have a relationship with a dependent variable, but it's highly possible they could have multiple relationships with each other. And so, as this illustration shows, uh, in a situation where you have four IVs and one VV, you could have ten relationships to consider. And so, as you add more IVs, the uh, potential for multicollinearity can increase. And so that's a, that's a, a situation uh, that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, now one last thought here, uh, this bottom gray box sort of gets us to that point. Um, some independent variables, some IVs, and sometimes sets of I, IVs are better at predicting the dependent variable than other independent variables. And some independent variables that you might try to put into your equation have no use at all for the model. And so recognizing that it's not, it's not in our best interest to willy-nilly just throw new in independent variables into our model, uh, but to actually think about those and do some pre-work to make sure that an independent variable is going to add value to the model, it's going to improve the model. And so we uh, need to keep that in mind as we go forward. Okay, so a uh, summary of what we've said so far. Uh, multiple regression is an extension of simple linear regression. Uh, we're going to have uh, not just one independent variable because that's simple linear regression, but at least two and possibly three or four and maybe five. Uh, and we're trying to use these additional independent variables to explain and predict the change in the dependent variable. But as we mentioned, uh, two problems could arise. One is overfitting, having too many independent variables, including some that don't contribute value to the model. And the other problem is multicollinearity, uh, in that we've included independent variables that seem reasonable, but we did not appreciate that they have an interrelationship as well, and therefore they have a negative influence on the quality of our model. Uh, in multiple regression, since we have um, multiple independent variables, each with their own coefficient, we need to know how to interpret each one, and we'll spend time on that. Um, recognize that when we start interpreting the results uh, and we start looking at how uh, multiple independent variables influence the dependent variable, we've got to say to ourselves for each one, when this independent variable changes, assuming the other independent variables don't change, 
here's what happens to the dependent variable. Uh, and that's really important, and, and we'll come back to that as we go through the uh, subsequent slides and lectures. Okay, uh, multiple regression um, equation uh, looks similar to a simple linear regression equation. Uh, in a simple linear re regression equation, it was y hat equals b0, which is the y-intercept, plus b1 x1, which is the which is the slope. Well, now that we have multiple um, independent variables, we have to add an additional um, variable set uh, to the equation for each of those additional uh, independent variables. So if we have two independent variables, it would be y hat equal beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. If we have three, it's going to be y hat equal beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3. Okay, so our regression equation just continues to expand based on the number of additional variables that we add. You can see the example at the bottom uh, where we've uh, inserted some just some arbitrary values where we've said that the slope, no, no, sorry, the y-intercept is 6.21. That's the point where our regression equation, our regression analysis crosses the y-axis. And then we've come up with a coefficient for the first variable, x1, our first independent variable, of 0 0.014 x1. Our second independent variable has a coefficient of 0.383. And our third coefficient has a negative relationship with the dependent variable, and it decreases the, the amount of dependent variable by 0 0.607. So if you look at the right-hand side, I, would, I would suggest to you I would read this. Uh, for the x1, the um, first independent variable, for every one unit in change in, in that variable, the dependent variable is going to increase by 0 0.014 units if it's dollars, if it's miles, if it's time, uh, that's the units. Uh, the, second, uh, the second independent variable uh, has a coefficient of 0.383, so we read that as for every uh, one unit change in x2, holding x1 and x3 constant, uh, y will increase by 0.383 units. And then we see that we've got a negative coefficient, or a negative uh, relationship with the third independent variable, x3. And so if we read that part of it, we say, we read that as for every one unit change in x3, y decreases by 0.607 units. So in this case, if our independent variable goes up, our dependent variable goes down because we have the negative number. And so that's how you read this. And that's the concept of thinking about the regression equation when you have multiple uh, independent variables. So let's we'll walk through an example. Let's do multiple regression analysis. Um, the first thing we mentioned, all going back to lecture one and lecture two, is it's useful when you set up your problem uh, to actually do some pre-work. And so look at the uh, example in the right-hand corner. Uh, you can see that in Excel, uh, I've set up a problem. In column A, we have independent variable miles traveled. In column B, we have independent variable number of stops, number of deliveries. And in column C, we have a dependent variable, how long did the trip take in hours? Um, so our pre-work. Uh, first thing we want to do is to be able to see, remember we said this before, and it's important for you to remember, is there a linear relationship between these independent variables and the dependent variable? If there's not, if either x1 or x2, if either the miles traveled or the number stops, don't have a relationship, a linear relationship with the time, then we can't use them. It makes no sense to use them. So we need to check those two. So we're going to do two, two scatter plots, one for miles traveled in time, one for number of deliveries in time to make sure there's a linear relationship. But as mentioned before, uh, a good investigator, a good, a good analyst would say, don't I also need to check to see if there's a relationship between the miles traveled, first independent variable, and delivery stops, second independent variable? Because remember what I said, if there's a strong relationship between those two variables, that's multicollinearity. And that creates distortions in our, in our um, 
in our model, in our analysis, and makes our model not as predictive, not as high quality as we would like. And so that's the third step, is we'll run a, a scatter plot between uh, x1 and x2 to see what that looks like as well. And I'll show you, I'll show you that in a second. So the uh, second thing is, once we run these scatter plots, uh, we'll examine uh, the scatter plots to make sure, A, there's a linear relationship, and B, that the correlation coefficient is, is representing that we have something reasonable, that we have a significant relationship between these two. Now, uh, so uh, I can tell you in a second that we, we do have a linear relationship, and I'll show you that, between miles and time. The miles go up, time goes up. Makes sense, right? It's intuitive. We also discover in a second, as I'll show you, that the number of stops make the trip take longer. That makes intuitive sense as well. Now, what you might might think is, uh, in terms of the um, number of um, miles we travel, does it have a relationship to the number of deliveries? And that's not an intuitive answer, but you, know, you might think the longer the trip is, the more likely I could make stops along the way. And so uh, you'll see in a second that, in fact, when we did a scatter plot of these two variables, and we looked at the uh, correlation coefficient, we saw that, in fact, we do have a strong relationship between those two variables. And you know what that means. That means uh, our relationships are linear and strong, but this last relationship suggests multicollinearity, which is a problem for us. So a quick look at the, uh, at the, the, um, at the scatter plots and the regressions that I ran. I ran a um, regression analysis between uh, miles traveled and the time it takes. Now notice that here in this dialog box, I also checked all the graphs. So I get my scatter plot as well. And so um, when I ran that, uh, I came back to, and looking, looked at the output. Notice that I have a strong p-value between miles and time traveled. Uh, but also down at the bottom of my scatter plot, notice that I had a strong linear relationship. So I'm looking for a linear relationship. I notice that I have a significant um, relationship between the variables because it's less than 0 0.05. And so everything I did here to check this out says that by running a simple linear regression between two of the variables, uh, this miles is a good predictor of time. I did the same thing with deliveries in time. I ran a simple linear regression. I looked at the scatter plot and noticed that it's a reasonably strong linear relationship. I looked at the p-value and noticed that it was 0 0.0050. And I said, this is a good, strong relationship as well. Now, the third thing that I suggested that you do uh, was to look at the relationship between the two independent variables. And so when I did this, I uh, set miles to be my independent variable. And I shifted deliveries temporarily to be the dependent variable. Uh, I ran the relationship. Now, notice at the bottom on the scatter plot that there's a strong linear relationship between the miles traveled and the number of delivery stops. Uh, and that's what our data is telling us. Also notice that the p-value says there's a significant relationship between these two. And so in checking the two independent variables for multicollinearity, I in fact discover there is multi a multicollinearity problem here. And uh, I need to fix that. Now, I want to show you how to interpret a regression output. So I'm going to set aside the uh, multicollinearity concept for, for a second, and just assume I went ahead, even though I know that there's multicollinearity in the problem. So uh, I look at this diagram, and I see a lot of the same things I saw uh, when we ran our simple linear regression. I have an R square that's very strong. It suggests that the miles traveled and the number of stops predict 92% of all the variation in time that it takes to travel. There's still something else that's 7 to 8%, but that's a really strong R squared. Well, I noticed that the uh, p-value is 0 0.02. So this is a significant model. It's uh, less than 0 0.05. Uh, I notice in my sum of squares that I have a very low sum of squares. This is an uh, unexplained sum of squares, 0.35. It's a very low number. So that tells me that the error uh, in the model is quite, is quite low. Uh, when I look at the P and T values, uh, the T value is used to generate the P value, and they sort of follow each other. But I see, uh, even though I had an overall P value of 0 0.02 uh, in the analysis variance table, I look at these P values in the uh, regression table, and I see some high numbers. I see 0.55 for delivery time and 
0.29 for miles traveled. And what that tells me is uh, that, that because of multicollinearity, uh, these variables independently, you can hear the thunder in the background, there's some thunder uh, that these two variables uh, are much higher than they should be, and that's an indicator uh, of a multicollinear relationship. And then finally, if you uh, come over to the right-hand side, um, you can see that I've got my coefficients, and that helps me uh, sort of understand um, that my average uh, time uh, for a trip is 3.56 hours, and holding deliveries constant um, for every um, mile, additional mile that I travel, I have to add uh, two tenths of an hour uh, to this 3.56 hours trip. Similarly, uh, holding miles traveled constant uh, for every additional stop, uh, I have to add 0.17 hours to my trip uh, of my my trip time of 3.56. And so you can sort of see that the uh, that the multiple regression gives us two coefficients to use um, that we can use those to predict. But when I have multicollinearity, I can't totally trust uh, the data that I'm getting. And so we'll we'll continue with that discussion in a second. Um, so uh, I have multicollinearity problem. So how do I fix this? Uh, well, the answer uh, when you have multicollinearity, when you have uh, two variables that are highly correlated with each other, uh, is uh, the basic way to think about this is you have redundant independent variables. You have two of these independent variables that sort of do the same thing. And so you don't need two variables that have the same role, have the same purpose and the same relationship. And so that's what multicollinearity tells you. And so what you need to do to fix multicollinearity is decide to get rid of one of the two variables where the multicollinearity exists. And so uh, the question would be, well, which one do I get rid of? Do I get rid of the distance traveled? Or do I get rid of the number of stops? And so what I did on this slide was I, I went back to the, uh, my simple linear regression where I regressed each independent variable by itself to time. And so I looked at, in the top left hand is the number of miles, and the bottom right hand is the number of stops. And so I started to look at the data, and I said, well, which one of these has the highest uh, error, uh, standard error of the estimate? And I noticed that the number of stops has a higher error than the uh, number of uh, than the number of miles traveled, and uh, that error is the distance of the data points from the regression line. So what it's telling me is that the delivery stops uh, data data points or observations were a little more scattered, a little further away from the regression line. And what I really always want is I always want my data points to be as tightly gathered around the regression line as possible. So I want to take the smaller value. So that sort of suggests to me that 0.32 that miles is a better better variable uh, for predicting uh, time than this number of deliveries. Uh, I look at the R square, the adjusted R square, and I, I note that uh, miles predicts 0.8945 of the total variation, whereas uh, stops only predicts 0.8864. Admittedly, they're very close, but but again, miles is a better predictor based on the adjusted R square. Um, I look at the sum of squares, and sum of squares is always very important to us. And I notice that the sum of squares for miles traveled is 0 0.4096. You can see that here. And I notice that the sum of squares for uh, deliveries is 0.55, and I want the lowest error possible. And so, I, again, that suggests that miles traveled is the better indicator. And so, finally, uh, I look at the standard error, and I notice that the standard error is 0.08 for um, number of stops and 0 0.006 for number of miles traveled. So what that tells me is, since I have multicollinearity, since I really don't want to use both of these variables, I want to use the best of the two. And the best of the two is miles traveled. All the indicators, uh, when I used my uh, simple linear regression, uh, my pre-work, tells me that miles traveled is a better uh, fit uh, for this model than number of stops. And so what I would do to fix the multicollinearity issue is I would just not use number of stops to, to make my predictions. Now, if that's the case, if I've taken away one of my two independent variables, I now only have one dependent variable, which is time, and one independent variable, which is miles traveled, 
And so I really am done because we're back to our lecture two concepts of simple linear regression. So uh, now I do want to show you uh, quickly uh, how to uh, look at and interpret the results of a multiple regression without introducing a whole new model for time's sake. And so let's go back to uh, the full model. Let's assume we still are using miles traveled and delivery, qu delivery quantity or the stop number of stops. And let's just suppose I've decided to ignore my multicollinearity problem. So, so again, uh, how do I read this equation? Well, the way I read this equation uh, is as follows, uh, and I've gone through this before. The adjusted R square is 0.87, so it says that these two independent variables account for 87% of the variation in the time. Um, I look at my p-value, 0.02, and again, this is a uh, a reasonable correlation is less than 0 0.05, and so this is a reasonable model to use. I still have my concerns about my um, regression table p-values because they're too high. That's the, the multicollinearity problem. Um, but I come over here and I look at my coefficients, and I ask myself, you know, how do I read this? And so uh, the way I read this is, as I suggested before, for every additional mile traveled, the time increases by 0.028 or 0.03. For every additional delivery stop, the time increases by 0.17. Now, when you say that, you also have to say holding the other independent variable constant, right? So, uh, for every additional mile holding the number of stops constant, time increases by 0.03. Or for every additional delivery stop holding the number of miles constant, time increases by 0.17 hours. So very important uh, nuance. Uh, and then notice that the, as I said before, these individual p-values uh, are there because of multicollinearity problems. Okay, now uh, one thing I want to say, and then I'm going to stop, and I'll come back and cover the last dozen slides in part two, is that all the data we've looked at so far, all the way through all the lectures, has always uh, coincidentally been uh, numeric. Uh, it's been uh, interval or ratio data. It's been time or miles, uh, distance, number of stops. It's always been uh, things that are, are numeric in, in nature. And, and yet you'll find often that you want to do certain things with regression analysis where the data itself is not numeric. Uh, and you can think of lots of examples. You give out a questionnaire and you have a true-false question on it, a T and an F. Or you ask someone for their gender, they're either male or female, you have an M or an F. Or you ask them which state they live in, and it's FL for Florida, or MD for Maryland, or MI for Michigan. And so uh, the next thing we need to understand is uh, how to do regression analysis when uh, one, of, one or more of the independent variables has categorical values. And so we'll talk about that in part two. Uh, it's very important that you understand that, so please listen to the second part. Uh, I'm going to end the discussion of Lecture 3, Part 1 now, and I'll come back shortly and do Lecture 3, Part 2.